This is the Fluorescence Lab Report for Colby Instrumental Analysis class. And in this lab, we wanted to measure the decay kinetics of the fluorescence of quinine sulfate in water solutions and the physical processes that affect the lifetime of quinine sulfate. We added a chloride ion in order to test to see how the fluorescence was or was not quenched and to calculate the um, rate constant. The first step of this experiment was to take an absorbance spectrum of our unquenched quinine sulfate sample. We used an ocean optics spectrometer and our absorbance peaks are right here between 400 and 300. The second step of this experiment was to measure the emission spectra of quinine sulfate. We used a quantum master instrument from PTI with a pulse nano LED as an excitation store source instead of a laser. As this spectra shows, our quinine sulfate emits uh, right here at around 450 nanometers. The third step in this experiment was to measure the fluorescence decay of a scattering solution, which we made from a dilute solution of coffee creamer, and our samples. So. The coffee creamer scattering solution is our blank, and we made five additional solutions that contained the chloride ion. So we made a 2 times 10 to the minus 2 molar chloride solution, a 3 times 10 to the minus 2, a 4 times 10 to the minus 2, a 6 times 10 to the minus 2, and an 8 times 10 to the minus 2 chloride containing solution. For our blank, we measured the fluorescence decay lifetime to be 19.53 nanoseconds and that had an error of 0 0.915 0 0.9015 for our 2 times 10 to the minus 2 molar chloride containing solution we had a lifetime of 7.558 and an error of 0 0.177 for the 3 times 10 to the minus 2 chloride containing solution we had a lifetime of 5.576 with an error of 0 0.1534. For our 4 times 10 to the minus 2 chloride containing solution, we had a lifetime of 4.478 with an error of 0 0.1175. For the 6 times 10 to the minus 2 molar chloride containing solution, we had a 3.392 measured lifetime with an error of 0 0.1355. For the 8 times 10 to the minus 2 molar chloride solution, we had a lifetime of 2.518 nanoseconds with an error of 0 0.1594. To be able to calculate the rate constants, or to get to a value of kq, we needed to calculate kf. And to do so, we divided 0 0.692, which is the half-life, by our lifetime in nanoseconds. So our kf for the blank was 0. 0.035433 and our next solution had a KF of 0 0.0915 our third solution had a KF of 0 0.124 the fourth solution had a KF of 0 0.154 the 6 times 10 to the minus 2 molar solution had a KF of 0 0.204 and our 8 times 10 to the minus 2 molar chloride containing solution had a KF of 0 0.2748. So, and this final column, column shows our error in those values. So then what we needed to do is we needed to create a graph that was the KF versus the chloride concentration in molar, in, in a molar set of units. And if that line was linear, then we would know that quenching was dynamic. And if it wasn't, we would know that the, dynamic, the quenching was static. And when we plotted our data, we got a very linear line that had a slope of 2.9529 with an intercept of 0 0.0342 and an r-squared of 0 0.99763, which is really good. So we can conclude from this data that quenching is dynamic. So our slope is 
2.95288795, which is listed over here with more significant figures than what's on the graph. And in order to find out what kq actually is, we needed to multiply this value by 1 times 10 to the 9. And so we get 2.95 times 10 to the 9 as our kq. We also needed to change the error that we had in the slope to match our new value that we had to multiply by 1 times 10 to the 9. So we did the same thing with the error to get an error of 7.2 times 10 to the 7. So we can conclude that our quenching of quinine sulfate is definitely dynamic. Our data looks really great. We have a really great linear line and our errors are, you know, pretty reasonable. So this instrument could be used to analyze two, analyze two different compounds with similar emission and excitation spectra. And this is possible because we can use our fluorescence lifetime data to tell the two compounds apart. So we could perform a lifetime experiment with different concentrations of quenching agents and see if they have static or dynamic quenching behaviors, or we could just see if different fluorescence lifetimes came up, or we could run any number of experiments to analyze our compounds instead of just using their emission and excitation spectra, which would be incredibly similar. So fluorescence lifetimes would definitely give us something concrete and differentiating between the two. In the instrument that we use to do all of our analysis, we used a 310 nanometer pulse diode to excite, to excite the sample, even though the maximum excitation wavelength is 350 nanometers. We can actually do this because a 310 nanometer pulse diode is higher in energy than 350 nanometers. And by using a higher energy, we can give it enough energy to excite the molecule without having to worry about hovering around that 350 nanometer mark where some molecules would enter the excited state and others would not, or other, or not enough electrons would get into that excited state to give us really good fluorescence data. So it's actually better that we use a 310 nanometer wavelength. Now if we ran the, this experiment was run at 25 degrees C roughly, you know, at room temperature, and we have really high rate constants. If we ran the entire experiment at 5 degrees C, then we would notice a decrease in how fast the reaction would run, and therefore all of our rate constants would be significantly lower. This is because at room temperature, we give the molecule some extra thermal energy that helps get them into the excited state that we want them to be in, and then they'll fluoresce more consistently. At 5 degrees C, we lose that thermal energy, and so it takes more energy from the light to get those molecules up into the excited state at a point where they can fluoresce down to the ground state. And so by having it at room temperature, we get faster reaction times and we get better data. Um, at the beginning, the first step of this experiment was to do the absorbance of the unquenched quinine sample. And this was an important piece of information because it showed us what wavelengths excited this molecule, which was really important in deciding which wavelengths to use for fluorescence because we needed to know what wavelengths would get them up into the excited state. And that was what we did during the fluorescence experiment.